Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Ria Saran, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Condé Nast Traveler Middle East, um, and I'm here to moderate the session on the future of luxury travel. Um, I'd just like to introduce our panelists today. Um, we have Anthony Chalanoc Cole, General Manager of Elegant Resorts, James Bridget, um, VP Sales and Marketing for IHG, Linda Celestino, VP for guest, of Guest Experience for Etihad, and Terry Kane, Head of Travel for the MENA region for Facebook, Inc. Welcome everyone, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, our panel today is called The Future of Luxury Travel, and what I would really like to start with is um, sort of the idea of what luxury means now and how it's changed, because um, I was recently, just a few weeks ago, um, in Oman at the Condé Nast International Luxury Conference, um, and the big thing that emerged from there was that just the definition of luxury has changed so much in the last few years. Um, and so, I'd sort of like to see how that how that impacts the travel industry and how we're looking at luxury travel differently now than we were before. So um, I can start with Anthony. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so from my point of view, being a luxury tour operator, um, so the property aside, I think the definition of luxury is really giving the clients the choice. So the choice of um, the product that we're offering, how we're displaying that product, our shop window, if you like, um, how we're able to allow the clients to transact with us. Um, and yeah, for me, it's about the choice. And if you give the clients the choice, then that's luxury. Mm -hmm. um, from a property point of view, I'll leave it with these guys. Okay, <laughs> and an air product. I, I guess that's my cue. Yes. <laughs> um, so from the, the hotel's perspective, um, luxury travel continually evolves. And the importance of personalized service is critically important. But we're seeing a second trend coming through as well, which is offering bespoke, unique, out-of-this-world experiences. Luxury travel really is going beyond a product to more what you can experience on property. Um, we are one of the largest luxury hotel players, intercontinental hotels, um, which is good and could be bad. We have brand standards in place to make sure we meet our guests' expectations and needs, but we know we have to evolve it. And one of the biggest things that we're doing at the moment is overhauling our technology to make sure that we can truly offer luxury. So we're partnering with Amadeus to look at our guest reservation system. And we're looking at how do we offer a seamless booking process by which our guests can tailor and personalize exactly what they want. So they can choose the floor they want, the room they want, the pillow they want, because that's what today's luxury guest demands. And actually, that's what today's guest across all of our brands want. And that is one of the biggest um, investments we're making globally. Uh, that will be launched in the Americas this year, and it will come to the Middle East in 2018. Great. And I suppose that actually um, depends on which market you're in. Um, and you need to be able to have that reservation yes. system to tailor, because yeah. different clients in different markets expect to book their product differently. They have different requirements. What's important to one region may not be important to the next. So it's about, again, giving that choice. Yeah. yeah. I think in the aviation world, of course, um, Etihad prides itself on not just selling transportation anymore. We have made it our remit to sell remarkable travel experiences. And luxury really is a fluid expectation. Um, it changes constantly as our guest changes, and what looks and feels like luxury in an economy class cabin could look very different in a business class cabin, or a first class cabin, or for those of you who've had the pleasure of something like the residence. Um, it is about choice, further to your point, it's about creating remarkable experiences that actually meet an individual's needs. In economy class, it could be as simple as navigating your way through the cabin with ease, having a very friendly service, having um, a bespoke menu, that can feel like luxury in economy class. Of course, in business class, it's a whole new level where you have sommelier-trained crew and you're given a very different level of product. And of course, right up to the residence where you have a Savoy-trained butler and you have a private jet experience, luxury is at the very end of that. But we are constantly um, addressing the fact that luxury changes daily and we need to be at the leading edge of that and really listening to our guests because what's luxury for one doesn't necessarily mean it's luxury for another. Uh, and uh, all of those comments <laughs> definitely resonate with, with uh, Facebook Inc. Um, and uh, I guess a little bit of positioning 
Um, Facebook uh, consists of Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, Oculus, um, and a number of other developing platforms. Um, we have we have about 1.8 billion people globally on Messenger every single uh, on Facebook every day. 600 million people on uh, Insta Instagram every single day, and every single one of those experiences is individual and personal to every single person. So our mission is uh, our higher level mission is, is connecting the world. And uh, when it comes to the travel industry, it's about really bringing those personalized choices uh, to the individual. 1.8 billion people doesn't really mean much to, to any of the brands in the room today, but what would be really interesting, I imagine, to Etihad would be the, you know, the 300,000 mothers of two children that live in W1, very close to, to you know, Heathrow Airport, um, who would be really keen to find out about the flying nannies. That's luxury. That's luxury, <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. So, from a Facebook perspective, it, it's uh, really the personalization at scale, I think, is uh, our focus on, on the luxury industry. Great. Um, so, it's, it's something that you've all sort of touched upon, but, um, and it's one of those, you know, so those trendy words right now, but everyone talks about experiences constantly, right? So, um, for instance, in Oman, we had a room full of luxury goods purveyors, and there was me up there talking about non-material luxury and sort of saying to them, oh, do you know American Express did this um, study, and, and they said that 72% of their respondents would rather spend money on an experience than on goods, and 88% of those want to spend it on travel. Um, or even in the GCC, I think Amex here did a spending habits in the GCC for 2016, 52% more for experiences over goods, which here is quite a big deal. So, um, you know, we've, we've been approached often to um, help a product create an experience around, you know, so for instance, we did it for a car company. We, we, we tailored an entire evening that involved a private jet and dinner and, you know, all because it was a car launch, which, you know, car launch was seemed at the end of it not the most important thing, but it was memorable because it was an experience. Um, so we are inherently an experience industry. So what does this mean, this, this rise of experiences? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whoever wants to go first. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we've been creating experiences for our clients for 30 years, and, and it's really at the very heart of what we do, um, right down to, as I say, the, the choice that we give them, but also then really understanding what the client wants to get out of their trip, right. um, whether it's a business trip or whether it's um, a family leisure holiday. And really then um, the experiences that we can add into that concierge service that we that we offer um, becomes very, very important to each individual client. So, um, and, and actually on a, on a separate note, the type of holidays that people are now looking for is absolutely, the experiential travel is just so prevalent at the moment. It's just amazing. And we're finding this region, um, people are going away for maybe two or three breaks a year. And um, yes, they'll go and sit on the beach for two or three nights once, but then they really want to get out there and explore the local communities and have those local experiences and um, our uh, consultants travel extensively themselves they experience these and they can talk firsthand to the clients about um, what they're likely to um, to experience on their holiday and it just becomes very important to the clients that we're able to tailor exactly what they want yeah, I, uh, I, I couldn't agree more and um, I touched on trend that we're seeing in luxury in terms of um, experiences. We at Intercontinental are launching curated experiences by Intercontinental this week, nicely timed with the ATM theme. Um, we're doing it off the back of the demands of our guests. You know, our, our concierge teams are great teams around the region, but we're finding the requests and the experiences of what they want to do. It's becoming harder and harder because everyone wants an out of this world uh, uh, experience. So some of the created experiences that we're pulling together, to give you some examples, Intercontinental Aqaba has what it calls the Martian experience. So that's where we take guests into the rare earth that is Wadi Rum, where Matt Damon did the film The Martian, for those Matt Damon fans out, out there, um, to give them something a little bit special and then come back and, and experience some Jordanian food. Or it could be in this city, at the Intercontinental Dubai Festival city, where you can sit with a personal shopper or a stylist for the afternoon having high tea. You can discuss what you'd like in terms of what you're looking for. They'll then take you shopping. You'll find your wardrobe. And then if you want to go for dinner, that personal shopper will take your clothes back, put them in the wardrobe, and then you can carry on and experience what you're doing. But even then, with these curated experiences, we still know that we need to personalize it. 
because if we don't personalize it, it still doesn't resonate with what somebody wants out of what they're doing. I'd like to sign up for the shopping experience. <laughs> I think that you sounds like me. Um, you know, from an in-flight perspective now, um, the experience itself is what's the differentiator. We are now competing against other airlines. Everybody has a flat bed in business class. Everybody has in-flight entertainment. Some people may have more than others. Um, but the tangible product now is not really the differentiator. It's the experience. It's the way you deliver it. It's the service and hospitality that we layer over those tangible products. And again, it's choice. You know, giving a business class guest the opportunity to choose when and how they dine to personalise their particular journey um, is around luxury, it's around choice. The experience of having an in-flight nanny to um, help with our extra special guests, that's an experience. Not everybody gets to face paint from Abu Dhabi to London, um, <laughs> but we can provide that experience in the cabin, which of course makes mum and dad very happy. So the experience for us is really a not negotiable now. We know that we deliver flatbeds, we deliver safe aircraft, we deliver state-of-the-art in-flight entertainment, we deliver Wi-Fi. All of those are just expected now. The experience that we can layer on is what really differentiates us from our, our neighbours in the region. So, so look from a, uh, a, a personal story, if, if you may, um, last weekend I visited Petra for the very first time. I've been, enjoy I've been in the, the Middle East for 10 years, absolutely unbelievable experience. Anyone that's never been to Petra before, please go. It's absolutely surreal as a, an experience. But that experience for me was, was curated, and it was curated by my friends and family. Um, it was curated, I, I posted on Facebook for looking for recommendations from friends and family, who's been to Petra, what would, you, what would you recommend? And immediately the feed starts to fill up with, I recommend visiting here, staying here, using this uh, tour guide, etc. And the tour guide that I picked up on came from a recommendation. It was a personalized tour guide that picked me up from the Dead Sea, brought me to Petra, and then walked me through that journey of Petra, but didn't just say, here's Petra, and point out things. He told the story of Petra the whole way down uh, throughout that experience. And of course, what am I doing during that experience? I'm going live and talking about you know, the, the unveiling moment that you walk around the corner and you see the, uh, the, tre the treasury. And uh, that, that then goes to, to my friends and family, who they then realize that actually Petra is very accessible. Because I was with my wife, my daughter, my mom and dad, and they're seeing that actually Petra for me is, is an accessible journey, just as it would be Vietnam, just as it would be any, any destination, Indonesia, etc. So from an experience standpoint, I really think it goes back to the old time uh, adage of nothing is more important than the recommendations of your friends and family. The people that you trust the most, that's a curated experience. People who know me the best will know what I like. And really that's where I think that the, the, the platforms uh, that, that we have bring that personalization to life. And obviously the challenge for brands is how do you fit into that story? How do you fit into the world of this is my personal diary? How do you create for me and curate for me? And I think that's, uh, that's an interesting you know, place that we're, we're, we're going, a paradigm that we're going through at the moment, moving from this broad scale marketing and advertising for uh, you know, the luxury sector to really personal, really individual stories. And gone are the days one piece of uh, creative lasted a full quarter so now you're creating it thousand pieces on a, on a regular basis, you know, it's, it's and very I think interesting. That, that, that speaks to the power of social media, that the power of your brand or your experience is only as good as your guests have posted. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, we produce a lot of marketing collateral, but you only need somebody on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram to post something different. Um, and that colours the view of your experience. So it's interesting. It's a, a powerful medium now. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And, and how you respond to the good and more Absolutely. importantly, the bad. Yeah. How do you turn the bad situation into the positive? And just to add to that, um, from our point of view, we're working with someone like Elegant Resorts who are been, have, have been delivering this high level of uh, client service for 30 years, um, every client is assigned one travel consultant and they're with them all the way through their journey with Elegant Resorts. And they may say, I want to go to this hotel because my friends and family recommended it. And they say, well, it's not suited to you because of X, Y, and Z. However, I've been personally to this property and it will because of X, Y, and Z. So it's actually, I've, I, I feel there was a, an explosion with the online aggregators and this online you know, booking.com. I, I, when I first moved here, I thought it was my biggest competitor, actually. It's my biggest tool now because everyone uses that as the price point. So I know that if we deliver our personalized concierge, fully tailored holiday package at the same price as 
booking.com for the accommodation element, I know that we should win that client because we've delivered the service, we've personalized it, we know their preferences, and we are just as competitive as what they think is the, the only way to book in this region. So um, yeah, from personal, it's sort of similar, from personal recommendation, our clients and our, uh, and our consultants do have that connection. Just building on that from a, a hotel perspective, I think the, the, the biggest example I can give is historically we would tell our guests or potential customers how good we are. We can no longer do that. We used to do that through star ratings and the likes, but the reality is you hear less noise about star ratings now and more noise about those aggregated ratings, whether you're a four out of five or a four and a half out of five is critically important because your guests will tell you how good you are and then they might make recommendations to people that are traveling to Petra as to whether you should stay in that hotel or not. Absolutely. I know, that's, that's really interesting to me because that that's actually was one of my next questions, to just sort of say, you know, how has decision-making for people changed? Because that is another thing that's changed, and decision-making has changed via things like this. And do you want to talk a little bit about the city guides um, application yeah, in yeah. Facebook as well? Because I only noticed it, to be honest, quite recently. Yeah. It, it's, um, it's only only very recently been released, yeah. um, but but uh, I guess just briefly on uh, one of the key changes in how decision making is mm -hmm. being made now, uh, which I, I do think that the travel industry is yet to fully adopt is this. Yeah, it, it is this, and and you know five years ago we were sitting here at ATM talking about is mobile going to happen? Are people going to make bookings on mobile? <laughs> Um, I think it's just unquestionable. You know, there's just if you if you don't believe in it, you're, you're living in a uh, you know you're That's living in an abyss. It, it is here. Being. People are getting their information here. They're getting their recommendations here. And if they're not booking with you here, yeah. then your experience here needs to. Needs and to and it's different. about being that market specific as well. I mean, I, I report ultimately into my MD in the UK and trying to uh, have her spend the day in my world where we are literally um, assisting clients um, on WhatsApp and, and you know confirming bookings on WhatsApp. It's just completely foreign to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, it's about that the luxury requirement here is they just want to have it on WhatsApp so they can yeah. read it and respond and, uh, when they want to. And that, again, it adds to the luxury element. Mm -hmm. But it's market specific, and yeah. I think we need to be aware of that. Yeah. The, um, our mobile channel is our fastest growing channel. So $1.6 billion comes through mobile revenue for us around the world. How much, sorry? 1.6? And then when you look at $1.6 billion, and then when you look at the growth, that's remarkable because the growth is 33% year on year. Yeah. So it's not just a big channel, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And exactly to your point, you know, if you think that you can uh, ignore the mobile phone as a booking channel, absolutely not. Yeah. And then that means that you've got to think differently about how you uh, put content, because content has got to fit well. How does your logo look on mobile? Everything like that is critically important. Yeah. And, and, and you know our generations, if you will. Uh, apologies if you're your younger generation than I am, but our generation, we're, we're not digital natives. You know, it, it's it's that next generation who just wants sim. And that generation are today's you know travelers, the, the tomorrow's luxury and affluent travelers. They will just simply not accept anything other than in their hand or beyond that in the future. You know, uh, immediate access to information, real time, personal to me right now. Um, and curate it. Agreed. I think gone are the days where anybody, well, I think in some sectors it still happens, but gone are the days where we had to wait and make an appointment and go into the travel agency. You, yeah. know, you know, now everything's, as you said, instant, accessible. Luxury is about being able to do what you want, when you want, mm -hmm. and how you want. Yeah. And if that's on a telephone at 38,000 feet on your mobile, that's how you book your next trip, then that's what our guests want. And, and, you um, know, the, so it's completely changed the dialogue, it's completely changed how we have to respond, um, and it's exciting, it it's is. scary. Yeah, it's scary and exciting. <laughs> it's, it's exciting too. But, but one of the things that I think luxury really is, if we come back to the Uber adage, you know, Uber is not a taxi app, it's not a transport app, it, it's an app that saves people time. Yeah. It's a time it's respecter, luxury. it's a luxury, you know, it, it's, it's, it's seeing where you're right, it's seeing how long you have to wait inside versus outside, that's respecting my time as an individual. 
And this is really where, you know, the, I guess that access to information, mobility of information, mm. that, 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 that to me personally is luxury and I'm sure to, to many other people as well. And people are willing to pay, you know, I think, was it 30% more for Uber than a standard cab, I think? Um, uh, but, yeah. you know, they're willing to pay that premium to have the luxury um, of being able to have the on-demand and, and everything that goes with the service. So it just proves that, that, that actually a, an, an expensive curated holiday is not necessarily, um, it, it's all about the value that you add into it to, to give that true value. So it might cost more, but if you're getting more for it, then people are willing to, to pay, and especially in this region, for sure. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting because then obviously what we're seeing is one of the ways that luxury has evolved is that time has become a very important part of what the luxury experience is, which kind of, I think, somewhat segues into one of my other questions, which is sort of uh, talking about one of the growth areas, which is sort of wellness and, and, and the wellness, wellness tourism and the wellness industry altogether. Um, but, you know, I, I read that um, wellness tourism accounts for $563 billion industry, spas $99 billion industry, so it's, it's absolutely enormous. And both, those, both uh, the spa industry and the wellness tourism industry are growing faster than just tourism altogether um, and higher than like the IMF predicts for like, you know, GDP <laughs> growth rates. So it's, it's pretty significant. And I think part of that is people trying to take time back um, that's one of the things. I mean, it is a, a bunch of different things, but I think one of the things is obviously people trying to take time back. So um, is, that, is that a trend that you are seeing in your various um, areas and something that you're adapting to? Always, uh, always has been, always will be, um, and um, wellness and health and well, well-being and it, it is now a core element of people's holidays. They, you know, gone are the days where I think people just um, are completely excessive on holidays. There's a real conscious decision now that yes, I'm on holiday. I'm going to relax. I'm going to enjoy myself and eat fine foods. But actually, I'll get up and I'll I'll do my exercise classes and I'll uh, maybe take part in one of the programs. And uh, brands such as um, Six Senses, for example, they um, they before you go on holiday, if you want to. They do a full body analysis in your home country. They tailor the menus and the F&Bs and the activities based on your genetic makeup. So it's really going to that next level. And I think um, people who provide the products, um, if they're thinking like that, then they're going to do very well. So at um, IHG, we actually built a brand around wellness, which is called Even, Even Hotels. And we've already launched it in the US with huge success for everything that you were just saying around the importance people place on wellness. So this brand basically looks at a mini gym in the room. It looks at its food and beverage offering to make sure that they're offering healthy food because maybe historically hotels tend to tempt you with uh, all the amazing foods that you could eat that are not necessarily good for you. And it's a rapidly growing brand. And we will be bringing it to Australia um, in the next year or so. And we'll clearly look very close at this market. But even with what we've seen in the Middle East over the last 18 months, which has been difficult trading conditions in certain markets, we've got hotels like the Intercontinental Doha that has built the biggest spa in the Middle East at a time when investment's difficult to get hold of, but they recognize that investing in that and the demand for wellness, certainly in Doha, is phenomenal. So even with the market pressures that we see, the investment is still going in this area. We've certainly noticed, um, certainly for our premium guests traveling out of Abu Dhabi, our new first class lounge has a complete gym. So not like a little hotel gym, it has a complete gym. We have a six sense of spa so that you can have a spa treatment, a massage. Um, you can start your health and wellness journey before you even get on the aircraft. Um, and that's been incredibly popular. And the ability to choose your menu with your own chef on board. Um, you're not now restricted to aircraft food. Um, you have the ability to have a light salad or something made freshly prepared for you. And we've noticed that that's really well appreciated in the premium cabins. Well, I mean, again, wellness is a very broad term. It means a, a lot of very different, different things, things. To, to everyone. And whether you're traveling for business or traveling for leisure, whether you're traveling for, for medical wellness or just general wellness, is, you know, it's very different things. Um, my, uh, my business travel, my, my wellness and my business travel is speed to the airport, speed through check-in, uh, the business lounge, and then you know, how quickly I can get to and from, from no meetings. Stress. And say, no stress. No stress, that's um, wellness. <laughs> and I, I seem to be at airports more than uh, I seem to be at home at times. But uh, so, look, well, wellness from a business travel perspective, the opportunity I absolutely believe is is, is knowing when I'm in market. So knowing when I'm in, uh, you know, wh wherever it might be in the world, San Francisco, for example. Mm -hmm. If I'm there in San Francisco, why not tell me about something that I'm interested in 
in order to do while I'm there in business. Uh, so I'm interested in, you know, whether it be a, uh, you know, a, a gym class in the morning, a spinning class, which seems to be super popular in San Francisco. Uh, tell me about it while I'm there so I can do it while I'm there. Don't tell me about it well in advance or well after. Give it to me real time and I will make time for that on, uh, on business travel. Then on the leisure side of things, a lot more planning goes into family holidays than, than you know, any other type of holiday. So yes, educate me about what is good for, for my family while I'm away because every one of this family unit has a different need. You know, my daughter wants fun, wants excitement, wants to play around. My wife wants to relax and, and you know, be a, be a woman and not be a mother only and, and have fun as well. Uh, whereas I'm looking for everyone else also to have fun as well as my own fun. So tell me the things that I can do with my family in different ways. It can be exactly the same property. For example, at any IHG resort in the world aimed at families, there'll be something there for me, there'll be something there for my wife, but both of us are looking for different things in, ter in terms of that wellness. And that's really, again, where that uh, data knowledge, data utilization of platforms comes into play, that you speak to me as an individual, not as a, not as a broad member of society. Um, and do you see, or do all of you see, this sort of data collection and being able to use it in real time and thus create a more personalized experience for people um, to be completely happily coexisting with the whole idea that people seem to also want to be, want to go back to sort of the human element of travel? Um, and what is this human element of travel? Is it just service? Is it connecting with people on ground? Is it, what is that? From our point of view, we collect as much data for, um, about our clients as possible and have all their preferences um, and then link that in with the fact that every client has their own assigned consultant. So um, it just, yeah, it, it goes hand in hand. Yeah. It's, it, it's critical. But I guess the man from the hospitality industry would say that, you know, we don't call ourselves the hotel industry, it's the hospitality industry. And we've all been to hotels, that are phenomenal hotels, but the service was disappointing. You can actually have pretty average hotels with exceptional service that you actually have a great time at. Yeah. So service is critically important. And we at IHG would say, look, technology is an enabler. So all the work that we're doing behind the scenes to create convenience for our business travelers or our leisure travelers is a, is a starter. But the reality is our service comes to life through our people. Um, particularly on property through our front desk team, through the guys that are serving your breakfast. If we don't get that right, it's uh, terminal. So even in a world of Facebook and um, so other social mediums that um, everybody uses, the human touch element is critically important. No, we agree. Um, certainly our people make the difference. I think over 70% of our compliments across the airline uh, for our people, whether it be in our in-flight cabin, in our lounge, or in our airports. And very rarely does somebody write in about how wonderful the tray table looked, um, or how fantastic that blockbuster movie was on that flight. It's all around the people and how you deliver it. We've also seen that we can have a remarkable product, but if we don't deliver it, um, the whole experience is tainted. So we've spent a lot of money and a lot of time investing in our people and making sure that we don't um, drop the ball at that end because that has huge power once you have the guest in your hand. I think with loyalty programs now and with the data available of the guests travelling with us, we do get a lot of opportunity to know preferences, um, but at the end of the day, if you don't deliver it through your people, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And, and yeah, uh, for, I, I love the old adage, I worked in hospitality for many years in the travel industry all my life, but uh, the adage that you can uh, make up for a bad meal with great service, but you can't make up for a great meal with bad service. Absolutely. Whatever, whatever it yeah. is, uh, it, it rings very true. Look, it's a, it's a people-based industry. Mm. The experience that you will have will always be people-based. Um, I think where technology is enabling uh, this conversation is uh, facilitating access to the right people for the right reasons at the right time. Um, and the messenger bot's a great example of this. Mm. Uh, go in and chat on a messenger bot, book your full journey on a messenger bot, chat to the concierge in the hotel through a messenger bot. A mix of artificial intelligence, a mix of real people, but what it does, it talks to me personally mm. uh, once again, so it's, it's no, no, no generic messaging. It is Terry that they know. Um, and you know, uh, again, CRMs, uh, fantastic uh, if you get it right in organizations. I've been there, I've done it. Great challenge as well in terms of keeping data as a big part of that uh, knowledge base of service. Um, but the world's biggest CRM is, is Facebook. It's right there for people. Um, and the challenge is to, to maximize and utilize the data that exists in it for, for all of the brands in the room today. Um, so they can offer that personalized service and people really bring it to life when they know. Walking into a hotel and people knowing me for me is 
Um, as I've experienced with W Hotel specifically, fantastic. They walk in, they have a book of me. It's a LinkedIn profile of, on the, the front cover <laughs> of my book. I'm there in business. But it's a personal touch, Absolutely. and it's the Instagram touches as well that they print out for me. That, that means something to me. That, that, brings me uh, that brings my loyalty to the brands. Yeah. Sometimes the pictures they find of you on, uh, <laughs> on, the, on the internet are pretty interesting. I've had that. Um, I think it was once um, in San Francisco at a hotel and once um, here at a hotel where they found some pretty old <laughs> <laughs> photos on me in social media somewhere. Um, it was a very pretty amenity, yeah. but, <laughs> but it was pretty interesting. Um, so the city guide, sorry, that I touched on yes. very briefly earlier, is that something that does that? Does it connect you to local people, or is it more yeah. just connecting you to your friends and families and what they, what they liked, which you could get, I guess, off your news feed as well? Yeah, so, so yeah, apologies, I skipped over that earlier. Um, th this has recently been launched in, in beta in the past uh, mm -hmm. month. This is basically, uh, and it's, it's available in New York right now and a couple of other countries, uh, cities, destinations. Um, but basically, it, it's an amalgamation of everything that's good within the city according to your community. So the people that, and brands that you're connected with, this will bring those recommendations to you. So if I wanted to go in and find an Italian restaurant in London, I would be easily able to see which Italian restaurants my friends have reviewed, been to, visited, and I can message them and contact them immediately. It will also enable restaurants themselves and other destinations and attractions uh, to book directly uh, with the restaurants, so making it easy to stay within the app, no jumping between different experiences. Um, and obviously then it brings that social element as well. So coming back to the, uh, the belief that friends and family are the most important uh, people in your lives and therefore their recommendations count more than anything. Um, that, that, that's bringing that to the forefront of a destination. So good for people, good for businesses, and hopefully good for experiences as well. Um, this will roll out globally throughout the year. Um, so it's, it's pretty obvious how um, Facebook, I guess, and Instagram sort of um, leverage what people know, um, so, uh, your friends and the recommendation in your community, but how do you build that kind of community for, for instance, Elegant Resorts or um, IHG or Etihad? Um, yeah, but from our point of view, we um, we do lots of um, client interaction events where we, there's a certain segment of our client database called the Chairman's Club, and they regularly get together um, events organised by ourselves or, or themselves, and uh, sharing ideas and uh, and service uh, preferences and dislikes. I'm sure, um, but yeah, that community within our client base is, is very much there. Um, but I think really more relevant to us is it, it's about having that um, that system, having the, the all their their data uh, captured and and then um, actually using that appropriately for that client. So a bit, a bit of both. Yeah. We, have, we have obviously lots of different touch points. So the most obvious one is our reward program, which is IHG Rewards. Um, we have over 100 million members, which is the largest hotel uh, loyalty program. Um, but you have to have the ability to personalize with it. So it's all very well having the largest. But if you don't speak to them properly, you don't offer them the right information or the right offer that would be appropriate to them, you're actually interfering or annoying them. So we work very hard behind the scenes around buying behaviors and what offers we should give them. Should we give them the offer in Australia or is it more America or, and what is it they're looking for is absolutely critical. So that community is very, very important to us. And then of course, in the world of intermediation or uh, technology on how people buy, once the guest comes in and stays in the hotel, that, that is our opportunity to interact with the guests and to make them feel special and to make them feel individual and to create that loyalty that we all want for our businesses. I think for us too, I think social media has absolutely changed the way that we build a relationship with our guests. So our community is often online. And if you look on the Etihad Facebook page, we have one of the fastest response rates to our guests. And it's about being accessible and creating dialogue and having conversation over sometimes the most mundane of things, <laughs> but sometimes really important things to the guest. And we found that that's been an area that we have invested a lot of time and resources in, but one that has actually been very successful for us. It's relationship in business. And when you build a relationship with somebody that's about to have an experience with you, they're part of your community then. So it's something that's worked really, really well for us. Cool. Um, so we've sort of talked a little bit about the, the way things have changed and how we've sort of adapted to them and how we're sort of chugging along with that. But um, if we sort of look forward into our little crystal balls, 
um, a little bit and just sort of see where um, each, each of our industries is headed. So is it a new golden age of travel and what does that mean? And what is the role of a hotel going to be in the next few years? And what is the role of something like Elegant Resorts in the next few years? Or how is Facebook and Instagram going to keep up with people in the next few years? Um, where do you see things going? I know that's a p quite an open-ended question, but feel free to touch on design and people and future and technology and... I, I genuinely see it going full circle from um, traditional travel agencies where you, where you book an yeah. appointment and you go and see them yeah. um, to this uh, new world of the internet and I can just book my hotel instantly mm -hmm. to actually going, I want that really bespoke tailored service, which you can only get by booking through um, someone like Elegant Resorts mm -hmm. and, and our competitors. You know, um, There's a, a, another company within... Um, Dubai and again we're, we're, we're socially friends the guy, the guy who runs that and um, we, we meet often and actually it's a good thing that we are stimulating demand uh, in, a, in, a, in a market that I feel is quite immature in its um, buying approach mm -hmm. we're stimulating demand in truly bespoke created luxurious uh, uh, holidays and experiences so I think it's gone full circle and we have a real opportunity here um, to elegant resorts and our competitors have a real opportunity to just get that message out there mm -hmm. that, um, that you, you won't pay more for your holidays but you get a lot more value out of it. We, um, so we're one of the uh, longest standing hotel groups, if you like. Um, we know we have to constantly evolve. We work very closely with futurists and consultants, as yes. big companies do. Uh, what, Faith um, Popcorn, was that a recent thing? Yeah, so yeah. We, we, we've, we've done a few different bits and pieces, but the, the main reason we do it is the relevance of our brands in today's world and tomorrow's world is so critical. So we can't just talk about what's happening today through social media and other uh, things. We also have to think about what's coming tomorrow, which sometimes it feels far stretched. But if you don't think about it, then you could fall behind your competition. And um, one of the interesting things I heard from um, one of our futurists that talked to us about virtual reality mm -hmm. and the role that could have to play in the hotel world, which kind of blew my mind because I'm Generation X versus Millennial, right. so it takes me a little bit longer to <laughs> kind of catch up with these things. But um, they kind of shared three possible trends in virtual reality. One around clanning. So clanning is basically using virtual reality uh, to connect with your friends and family. You could be in a hotel room in San Francisco, one in London and one somewhere else. And you can share experiences at the same time using virtual reality. Um, the second one is, is more around gaming, so you could go to certain parts of the world and if you're avert to dangerous activities like cliff diving, you can do that using virtual reality in the safety of your own Absolutely. hotel room. <laughs> that, that one I would prefer, definitely. Um, and then the third one, which really did stretch my uh, uh, thinking process, was what 3D printing can do for you. So 3D printing could allow the hotel industry, for example, to prepare a wardrobe for our guests before they arrive. So we could know what size they are, what their shopping habits are, we could know what type of weather they're going to experience and we could fill a wardrobe at request, clearly of our, of our guests, and do that through 3D printing and have that hanging in the wardrobe ready for them to arrive. So these things sound far stretching but when you think about it, you, you know, you've got to be prepared to uh, lean into what technology could offer you in the future. I mean, they are already using 3D printing on planes, even, aren't they? Buildings, I think. They've, Sorry? They've, they've created 3D buildings, yeah. 3D printed yeah. buildings. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, and I, I think, was it like the tray table or yeah. something on planes yeah. are now yeah. being it's 3D done. printed or something, something like that? I mean, I love the term, the, the golden age of travel, and yeah. I think Etihad absolutely owns that space right now. Um, launching Flying Reimagined and, and our whole remarkable campaign. I think we've brought back the glamour and luxury to travel. I think we went through a very operational phase within the aviation industry, which was very transactional. But um, we've really gone back to designing and bringing a bit of glamour and luxury back, regardless of what cabin you're traveling in. If you look at our new cabin interiors, I don't know if anybody's traveled on the Etihad A380. Hands down, one of the most beautiful aircraft um, I've ever been on. I've been on a lot, been in the industry a long time. Um, and it's about the attention to detail and, and, you know, the smaller things that people actually take notice of. The amount of time and effort that goes into designing a seat or designing a cabin where you're thinking about lighting and texture, 
and um, movement in the cabin, smells in the cabin, noise levels, all of that comes together to deliver an experience. And that's where virtual reality and, and the digital platform is absolutely changing the way we do that. In a virtual environment, we can do a mock-up of a proposed seat of the future and actually walk through a cabin and see how it looks and feels and you're not building anything, you're not investing in anything um, until you sign off the look and feel. So it's really exciting. But it's literally, it's changed the way we do business right from the very beginning. I think 30 years ago when I came into the aviation industry, we were trying to design experiences that were totally different to what anybody experienced on the ground. Remember when people used to save up to go on an aeroplane and everybody got dressed up and it was such an event? I actually remember that. Um, so we were designing product and experience that really took people out of their everyday life. We have totally come completely the opposite, where we now need to create products and experience that mirror your everyday life or your everyday life, because that's about luxury, that's about choice. I want to be able to live my life at 38,000 feet while I travel to JFK. Um, and that's the challenge, but, but certainly the golden age of travel. I'm going to do a plug. Please go around to Hall 2. Go and have a look at the Etihad mobile vehicle. We've got a residence on display. So if ever you've wanted to travel the residence, today's your chance. Mm -hmm. um, we have a butler on hand that will give you the full golden age of travel experience if you pop down and see us today. Great. And Terry? Like I've reward points if I fly the residence? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now that's a personalized discussion. We might have to have that separately. Uh, we've literally just spent uh, two days uh, at our uh, F8 conference in uh, San Francisco last week talking about the immediate future and, and as you can imagine in the tech world it's, uh, it, it's fast moving. Um, I, think, I think maybe the best way to look at it, how we look at the future and I think we're very much driving part of that with, with people. Um, is, is hanging it under the umbrella of connecting the world. So we want to connect the world. We want to keep make the world more open and connected. That's our mission. That's what we all strive for. Um, and we really believe that there's, there's an enormous opportunity out there um, from connecting the unconnected to bringing the likes of virtual reality into, into real time. And you, you mentioned the virtual reality, actual uh, real time experiences. Well, we're, we're using this now. Uh, and Mark uh, Zuckerberg used it as an example at our conference last week, um, where people can now just put on the Oculus and be in the IHG hotel room, where, wherever it might be, having the meeting and having the conversation, talking about should we stay here or should we choose this room? What about this spa in this hotel? What about, you know, an, an actual real-time experiences with friends no matter where they are in the world. So travel in, in that sense is uh, de definitely evolving into a, a, a new place, a completely new place. But what I would say to all the luxury brands in here is that, that you know, uh, this expertise is in your DNA. The platforms are changing, it's, but you, know, you, have a, you have a heritage, not a history. Um, and that's because of the service and the experiences you offer. Just the adaptation to platforms is really what's the changing, uh, the changing scene. Um, and yeah, the, the connectivity between you, you, your offering to the individual is, is going to be a, a consistent change for the future. And just to add, add one point on the virtual reality, we've actually bought the virtual reality kit now and a number of hotels have produced the video footage and we are actually putting the clients in resort and aiding their buying decisions. So again, I think that's a crucial um, change in how people are, are buying and I think that's only ever going to grow more and more. Yeah. But hopefully VR is going to remain in the sort of space where it's just so that they can decide what they want in real life as opposed to uh, actually deciding that, hey, you know what, I actually did skydive because that one time I had like <laughs> the Oculus on. I think it's never going to change that experience. <laughs> no. Great. Um, and just finally, just to talk a little bit maybe about future destinations, because um, I think destinations is kind of the one thing we haven't really talked about yet. Um, where, where do you see people in 2017, 2018, what are, what, are, what are sort of your predictions for where people and how they're going to, how they're going to be making decisions about those destinations and why they're going there? Because one of the things that we've heard a lot about, obviously for Traveler, we're always looking for what we should be talking about and where we should be focusing on. Um, and we've heard a lot about people um, booking now into time sensitive and emer you know, emerging and time sensitive, both of which are considered luxuries because uh, time sensitive with things like Cuba before it changes or mm -hmm. Antarctica before it melts or you know sure. um, or, and emerging as places people haven't been which is again kind of bragging rights and luxury 
Um, so that's sort of how we've been seeing it this year, for instance, um, and some of the destinations that we've seen. But what are some of your predictions and how, how are you seeing that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you've touched on Cuba. That's very much in the, in the forefront at the moment. Um, and then there are there are people starting to think about what what happens when things are not there anymore. Yeah. So certain nature reserves or wildlife or flora and fauna. So then they're trying to get out and see that. Um, interesting about Antarctica because obviously there's the the Maldives rising water level as well, which yeah. is a very real threat. Um, and that there could be, um, you know, it's quite feasible that within. A number of years, a decade or two, that there could be certain islands not there anymore. So there is this. People are realizing that um, there's things that they may need to go and see now. We, um, it, it's very difficult to isolate a destination mm. or yeah. to say that. Look, for 2018, this destination is going to. It's, you know, it's exactly what Terry was saying in terms of what each individual wants. What is definitely prevalent is because more and more people are hearing about more and more recommendations on social media. More and more people know about those kind of uh, timeless experiences you could enjoy, whether that's going to see the Northern Lights or whether that's going to see Cherry Blossom Kyoto. You know, historically in the hotel world, we would be telling our guests about that. Now they're coming because they know it's already there. So we're definitely seeing um, that drive certain business, certainly leisure business into our hotels where they're coming for a particular event a festival, something that's going to expire if you don't get there in a, a period of time. Yeah, you know, I think it's such a personal thing. I mean, for our quality-focused leisure group, you know, for some people that will be a weekend in New York watching, you know, New York Fashion Week, which we sponsor. Um, for other people, it may be a leisurely week in Oman. Um, we found that you really can't determine where the ne next hot spot is. It's really where your guest tells you mm -hmm. where the next hot, hot spot is. Um, and so we've seen a real varying level. You know, Maldives is always very popular in this part of the world, but just as much as Oman, you know, right on our doorstep. So it's interesting. Uh, so yeah, I mean, coming, coming back to that, that personalized uh, recommendation, I mean, I, I think what uh, mobile is doing to the world is making everything much more accessible mm. and destinations are way more accessible than they've ever been because friends and family have been there, therefore I can go there, therefore there's going to be an increase. And, I guess a plug for, for the Facebook ads world is that you can actually see how many people are interested in a destination right now and break it down by, you know, by their demographics, by their behavior, by their interests. Um, what I would also say is that destinations are adapting, and, and, uh, adapting themselves and that's partly through public, partly through private sector. I think that Airbnb is a great example of this, you know, an, an experience in Paris, uh, staying in a hotel is very different from an experience in Paris staying in the Champs-Élysées in an apartment above a bakery and your experience of Paris suddenly changes, although I've been there several times. Yeah. I have a different experience of Paris Great. itself. So that, that marriage between the public sector, and particularly the tourism boards, mm -hmm. marrying it with the private sector and bringing to life the new experiences within those destinations, I think that that's going to be a new rediscovery for, for individuals themselves. But again, it comes back to this personal. What's personal to me is very different yeah. from everyone else and the recommendations that I see through people that I trust is what will influence me and everyone else to travel to destinations. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to see if there were people sitting here who maybe had questions for you, since we are, we're all in the end. Um, yes, please. Is there a mic? Okay, there's a mic. Hi, my name is Tama. I'm the Managing Director of Velvet Marketing Limited UK. We um, look at um, a couple of things I really enjoyed that you touched on. It was the fact that um, a man in the tourism industry is always perceived as divorced from his you know, other life. He's always seen as a corporate man. And uh, a woman, uh, when we do look at her in hotels, um, we've looked at her only from a health point of view, diet or what have you. So um, Velvet Marketing did a research on 50 different families in the UK uh, who have children under the age of 12 and who have stayed in five-star hotels at least three times in one year. And we have found that the, tour, um, the hotels are still um, lacking understanding of dividing, um, looking at a family unit, which is the term you've used, from the ages of the children, 
and from the idea of um, uh, mum and dad wanting to spend time together. At the same time, when they do that, then we need to, as a, in the hotel industry, alleviate that guilt that the parents feel when they want to do that. And by doing that, we try to tailor an experience for the child to learn something. Um, so I wanted to understand um, from you um, how are hotels still not catching on that we have tweens, children from 8 to 12, who are very different from 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8. What is going on? <laughs> I think it's... Um... And I'm a parent of two children. I really need this. <laughs> So, uh, so I've got an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old, so, um, and I have to say I agree with you. I think the hotel industry has got a lot to learn on that basis. It's not just about personal individual needs for adults, it's also for children as well. I do feel, just to set expectations, that you need to be clear on which hotels are going to offer such a service because certain hotels are predominantly corporate hotels or business hotels. Yes, they do a little bit of leisure at the weekends or on those shoulder nights. So consequently, you know, they kind of fall probably very badly over in what you're requesting there. But I think on the flip side, for hotels that are 100% leisure, particularly those that are targeting families, broad and in terms of different ages should have better offerings in terms of what they want to do. I think the difficulty that sometimes we fall into, certainly some of our resorts, is trying to offer what they want because they all seem to want different things. Not an excuse, but kind of a challenge. But I think we could do a better job on it. I think it's a fair critique for the industry as a whole. Can I, uh... Especially 8 to 12, the tweens, because we've, we've just seen such a huge age compression now yes. with, the, with the technology, the, yeah. you know, the pop uh, lifestyle. So, you know, an eight-year-old now, the kids' club, I mean, it's yeah. not really, we need a tweens club, that kind you, of thing. You, you do want to capture their imagination, because from my standpoint, anything that can get my 10-year-old off his iPad is something <laughs> I definitely Exactly, want to and now we, we have kids' clubs with iPads. Yeah. And the parents don't want that either. <laughs> it, it's an interesting thing, actually. I, I, uh, I never quite understood why hotels, having been a hotelier as well, uh, a, you know, a decade of my life. Um, but as a parent, why don't hotels offer food that the parents eat, but in smaller portions? I, I never quite understood that. Well, why is it always burgers and chips or spaghetti? Yeah, 85% <laughs> of the people we interviewed said that they need um, half portion to everything they eat. Yeah. 85% of all uh, the 50 families that we interviewed. But there is a serious challenge to ancillary revenues in hotels for this because what I've started to do now when I travel is I will order off Uber food or I will offer off, order off Deliveroo, which will take it directly to my hotel room and it'll be exactly what I want for my child. So that, that is a risk to uh, obviously the ancillary revenue. Then you've got the Wi-Fi conversation, you've got the television conversation, Netflix is what you know, I, will, I will access on my iPad. So hotels really, I guess, have this challenge, and to your point, the futurist thinking is what hotel, what are hotels here now to, to offer for the future um, in this world of marketplaces and apps and instant delivery and instant gratification? It's interesting, just further to your point, when you're looking at kids' meals on board the aircraft, um, in the olden days, it used to be a tray full of Smarties and chocolates and everything that the child wasn't allowed to eat at home, because it was a treat. Um, and we've moved completely away from that. We, you know, probably not anywhere near as exciting for the child, um, but mum and dad are much happier when we provide really nutritious, pleasant to look at, um, but really interesting, healthy food. Yeah. That's such an interesting thing. We just had a debate in Condé Nast Traveler where we had two people sort of debating that, you know, the whole kids' menu and hotels thing and mm. whether that should be a thing and why is it always burgers and fries and pasta to my, tomato sauce. Yeah. And that's the last thing you need on an aircraft, yeah. a tray full of sugar with 10 yeah. hours left to go. Exactly. Um, you're setting yourself up for a long flight. I just want to say thank you. Incredibly interesting panel. Uh, I work at Visit California, so as a destination, we really look at the role of influencers. Mm. We talked about the influence of friends and family, but I wanted to ask your opinion of how does celebrity influence on social media platforms help promote that luxury product and obviously I'm wondering from a destination perspective what is that role of celebrity influencers? 
celebrity yeah. influencers. Yeah. I mean, well, we can say that that's smart marketing now too. Um, you only have to be on Instagram and we have a local influencer here from the UAE with over 900,000 followers. Um, pretty powerful marketing to have him sit in our first class seat you know, with a glass of Coke and go, you know, this is my next eight hours. And the influence that has in the market, um, I doubt that you would get the same kind of influence over a marketing collateral or an advertisement. Um, again, social media has changed the way we do our business. and. We don't really own the integrity of our brand anymore. Our guest does. Um, and the power of social media and the influencers being able to reach such a large group of people within seconds. Um, so it's something I think all of us have to be extremely um, engaged with and not sit back and look at what influence it has on us, but we need to be part of that journey. And it's about building relationship again, as I said, building relationship with those influences, with the people that are using your hotel or your product or hopping on your aircraft, um, and ensuring that that communication works in your favor. But pretty powerful, right? 900,000 followers. And the power of, you know, we had one influencer post a picture of them with our latest uh, in-flight magazine. And within, I think, hours, we had over 100 calls to head office saying, where can I get a copy of your in-flight magazine? <laughs> now, who reads the in-flight in magazine, flight, right? Perhaps. <laughs> you want to read the Etihad's <laughs> latest one. Um, but, you know, that's the power of influence. It's the power of social media. People find these influences to be very attractive. Um, and so if they're reading that in-flight magazine, I need to get a copy. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's next generation thinking as mm. well, because you, you know you've got a big influencer coming to stay at your hotel, and you know they're coming. It's pretty easy in a way to uh, impress them pretty quickly by offering an upgrade, or uh, because they're straight on posting, you know, and if you've got visibility of that and you know uh, that's going to give you great coverage, then, then fantastic. And you can't think traditionally about PR and comms. No. PR and comms through printed matter still works, it has a role, but it tends to be to a broader audience. When you work through influencers, you're really sub-segmenting who you're targeting and who they're talking to and who's following them. And that's advocacy at a whole different level. You know, there's the advocacy of our friends and family who we trust because they know us, but then boy, if you're following a celebrity or a, you know, a TV or a reality star and they are using a product or a service, there's a whole lot of power that, that comes with that too. And it does vary by geography. I mean, mm. celebrities, for example, our hotels in India, if we have a celebrity sure. anywhere near that hotel, <laughs> the yeah. impact is significant. So for, I guess from a, from a platform perspective as well, and, and being California, you guys work with uh, quite a few uh, influencers and celebrities. Uh, I mean, influencers, you, you could almost uh, morph under this authority of being close to a, a mm. family member because what, what, you're, what you're doing when you're, you're engaging or following an influencer is you're getting that backstage pass to their lives. You feel part of their existence. You feel part of, their, part of their community, sure. exactly. Um, so they bring an authority on a subject which might be relevant to, to one group of people but completely irrelevant to others. So that 90,000 or 100,000 group of people, that might be exactly the group you want to talk to rather than the broad scale media. So we noticed, obviously, influencers have played a big role on, on all of our platforms, but recently we brought out this opportunity for businesses to more meaningfully engage with influencers in a way that builds up the data on their back-end system so they're able then to talk to people uh, following that engagement as well. So uh, for Dubai Tourism, obviously, Shura Khan was in town recently, yeah. and you know, Shura Khan, great influencer in the Bollywood market and globally, yeah. Um, working with the, his team, etc., and bringing that to life on Facebook, but also then collecting the information enable to, to enable businesses then to talk about Shura Khan's experiences directly to the people that engage with it. That, that's been that latest development uh, this year, actually. Instead of just being a, a, a one-off engagement with an influencer, now you can build that into a proper pipeline of, of mm. uh, engagement all the way through to sales or visitation. I think we have time for just one more, and then we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Good afternoon, Rocco Santo Pietro, general manager of a five-star hotel. Uh, the take home is very clear. I think that time is basically the quintessential luxury items you can buy. Um, giving back time to the customer and doing things for them is basically what then turns um, 
the guest into your advocate, your, your prime advocate. That works well also with media and, you know, on marketing budget if we go into. Um, do you see, and this is for intercontinental, luxury has been also all inclusive? Um, you know, there is very little luxury company that do all inclusive uh, traveling. Uh, I've personally experienced some high end products for all inclusive, but uh, as uh, uh, you know, the market segmentation is completely changed. Uh, I would say there is no more market um, segmentation. Like the airlines have gone to the old days where everything was glamorous. Um, Intercontinental and all the top competitors are going with different brands which are targeting a selective group of people. Uh, does or would um, all inclusive apply to any of the big boys in, uh, in the industry? Well, all inclusive for intercontinental, no because we believe luxury is personalization. So all inclusive kind of tries to put everybody together. So to your point, you know, the segmentation of the leisure uh, and the luxury le leisure business has changed. One thing that we are seeing changing is what people define as luxury. So historically, it would have been that attentive service and the product and the delivery and, but that's changing rapidly and what we're seeing now is faster growth um, for other luxury brands that we would term in the hotel industry uh, luxury lifestyle. So we acquired uh, Kimpton Hotel and Restaurant which is um, one of the more pioneering um, hotel and restaurant brands in the US. We acquired that in 2014 deliberately to plug a gap in our portfolio, which is what we see coming through, where people's definitions of luxury is more around the style of the hotel, the fact that it's got a bit of a fun twist to it, that it's got a personality, that it brings the neighborhood story inside the hotel. And it actually, the strap line for Kimpton is ridiculously personalized. That's what they talk about. And they also talk about the benefits and the perks being very, very personalized, which is another reason that we're pushing into that. Because if we don't recognize that, to your point, all inclusive versus anything else, if we don't recognize the different needs for the different brands, then you will stand still. So we, we have Intercontinental that sits at one level. We have Kimpton Hotel and Resorts. And then we also have Hotel Indigo, which again kind of plays to that top tier, but is more of a boutique feel because, you know, I think Terry touched on it, everyone's looking for authentic experiences versus something that feels a bit more formulaic. Cookie cutter. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much for being here and for your insights. Um, and thanks for listening. And that's the end of this panel. Thank you. Thank you.